A lot of times I print the actual scripture on my notes, but this time uh, there wasn't enough of a note to actually do that. I'll be reading out of the Bible today, which, trust me when I say if it's printed on my notes, it came from the Bible. <laughs> Um, so we'll be starting here in three. Um, are we uh, recording? Mm -hmm. Okay. For those of you who may be watching this online, we want to welcome you and we want to tell you a little bit about who we are. We are Redemption House Church. We're located in East Tennessee. Uh, you can catch us online at redemptionhousechurch.com or you can, like here on YouTube where you're seeing this video, watch additional videos that we have. Uh, we tape all of our sermons and put them online. Um, so welcome. And uh, if you feel led by God to comment, we will look over your comments. If you need to leave a prayer request, um, we will review those requests and we will. I, the pastor will pray over them as well as uh, the leadership here in the church. So we thank you for watching. Um, to our uh, people that are here today and those that are missing, we just want to say uh, we love you. Uh, and we know that that goes out to those that are not here as well. We're starting today in chapter 3 of John. And this is probably the most famous chapter in the Word of God. Am I right? You can go and ask anybody on the street to just read me off the top of your head one verse of the Bible. And they are probably going to go to Ecclesiastes. No, I'm joking. They're probably going to go to John, the third chapter, the 16th verse, and they are going to read, For God so loved the world, right? Yep. And that's going to, it's in everybody. Everybody that's been churched at some point has come across that scripture. It's an elemental scripture that we all learn early on. Does anyone here not know John 3, 16? Have you not heard it? Raise your hand if you've not heard it, because we're going to read it. But that's okay. See, everybody here has heard it. And if, and if you haven't, I would be surprised because it is one of those things that people learn in Sunday school. It's one of the most common scriptures we have in the Bible that is shared. And it's, an, it's a, a scripture that tells us that we can be saved. But aside from verse 16, most of the people can't quote 17. I sure can't quote 15. How many without looking your Bible can quote uh, 317? Anyone? Okay. My point is that we picked that scripture out, and it's an important scripture, but there's so much more to the Word of God than just a scripture here and there. This chapter is rich. It's very rich, and we're going to learn about a, a person called Nicodemus. Who, who's ever heard of Nicodemus? Okay, a few of us. Nicodemus was a priest. He was somebody that was, well, let's just bring it up to modern day terms. He was a preacher. He was a teacher. He was a pastor. He was a, he was a, uh, a priest. And he should have known what pastors should know, right, concerning Christianity. So we're going to start in verse 1, and we're going to ask that people read two verses, and we're going to go around the room. Dustin, will you start in verse 1 and 2? Yes. The new birth. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night, and he said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do. Unless God is with him. All right, pause. Katie, we'll come back to you in a minute for three and four. So here's a ruler. He's a Pharisee. Now, Pharisees were supposed to know the, the, the law of Moses. They're the keepers of the law of Moses. So they're supposed to know what's going on spiritually within the, the Jewish nation. They're supposed to be on top of things. So here comes this ruler, Nicodemus. And he comes to Christ when? At night. At night. When nobody sees him. When he can't be caught by his other rulers. 
He tries to sneak in through the side door, doesn't he? How many of us have tried to sneak in through the side door? We didn't want to come in like we were supposed to. We didn't want to come in at an altar where everybody seen us. We wanted to come in. We wanted to come in on a side door. We, we thought if we just went there long enough, we'd be grafted in. Well, Nicodemus didn't want to to come to Jesus in the daytime and ask him these questions because he didn't want anybody knowing. He didn't know the answers. So we pick up in verse three and four. Jesus answered and said to him. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time onto his mother's womb and be born? Hmm. So let's look back at one and two. There's a Pharisee. He's the, 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 the keeper of the law of Moses. He's a ruler of the Jews. Verse 1. And he asked Jesus, he said, We know that you're a teacher. Come from God. No one can do these things unless God is with you. Did he ask Jesus a question? No. Did he ask Jesus a question? In those two verses, did you hear a question? No. You heard a statement. We know that you're a man sent from God because we've seen you do this and that. But what did Jesus do? He read his heart. And what did he do? He gave him an answer to the question that was never even asked. How many times has Jesus gave you an answer to a question you didn't even ask? <laughs> Lots. So Jesus answered him and said, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now Nicodemus didn't ask about being born again, did he? No. But now that you bring it up, Jesus... Pick it up in four and five, Graham. You mean five and five, six? Yeah, five and six. You just read five. Do you want me to pick it up in six? Hmm? You, no, just pick just, it up in five. Okay. Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Okay. So what's Jesus telling him? What has Jesus told him? He gave him an answer that he didn't ask a question for. And then he's giving him an explanation of that answer that the guy didn't ask a question for. But he's perceiving that's what this guy wants to know. Somebody's got something they want to interject here. But I'm going to carry on while you think on it. Seven. Judy? You should not be surprised by my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Oh, well, we got to stop there. That's too good. Let's go back to five. Oh, you actually have to go back to four. <laughs> Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter? Now he's being sarcastic, right? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Well, we all know you can't do that. So Jesus answered him and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. What do you think that means? I know somebody would want to comment on that. What do you think that means? What do you think being born of water is? Baptism. No. When you were in your mother's belly, what you in there with? Oh, fluid. Fluid. What do they call it when that fluid drains out? The water broke. Water broke. So that's talking about a flesh birth, right? Yeah. So, we're born of water, that means we've been born of flesh. Now, a lot of people seem to think it means water baptism, but it doesn't. Are you sure? Because in the next three words it says, and the Spirit, which would be 
Okay, and the Spirit. Yeah. And filled with the Holy Spirit. Yeah, and that would make sense. There are two baptisms, and I won't dispute that. But he's talking about rebirth here. And baptism in the Holy Ghost is not a rebirth. It, it's a act subsequent, usually, to salvation. It can happen at salvation, but it is not a rebirth in of itself. So, being, being born of spirit means that you are stepping into the knowledge that you are a new creature in Christ. That your old man, your old sin has been put away through repentance and faith in Christ. And now you're accepting that you are a new creature, a spiritual creature, and you have been made alive through the same power that rose Jesus from the grave. That salvation, that, that, that power, that blood, he has given you strength and newness of life in the act of conversion, getting saved. That is a spiritual birth. And, and some would reason that water baptism and spirit baptism is what this is talking about, but it's not. It's talking about being born of a woman and then being born of spirit, which is through Jesus Christ. Because let me tell you this. If you're not filled with the Holy Ghost, can you... If you don't get filled with the Holy Ghost, will you miss heaven? So then how can it be true if this statement says he is born of water and born of the Spirit? He cannot enter the kingdom of God. Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot be enter the kingdom of God. So if it's saying the Spirit being the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it's that, that verse would be interpreted that you must be filled with the Holy Ghost or you can't see the kingdom of God, enter the kingdom of God. So we, keep, we know it's not the baptism of the Holy Ghost because that's not a, that's not a requisite to go into heaven. There's a lot of Christians that have not been baptized with the Holy Spirit that have gone to heaven. Mm -hmm. So I want to clear up that confusion right there. So what he's talking about is he, he talks about here going on down in 6, that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. So he's talking about the flesh birth, which we all came through via a mother and a father. And he's, he's also talking about the spirit birth, which we came through by faith in Christ and the completed work of the cross and the remission of our sin. And then he's like, Do not marvel, in seven, that I said to you, you must be born again. This is a good verse here in eight. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound, but cannot tell where it comes from or where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. What do you think that means? What's that saying to you? That you who are born of the Spirit are like the wind. You can't tell where you're coming and where you're going from. You can't tell where you've been. You can't tell where you're going. You can't see the Spirit. Just like you don't see the wind. You just see its effect of moving the leaves and moving this. What if I were to tell you that that being born again, that the Spirit of God that comes in you, He's already existed long before you were. Mm -hmm. And even if you, you happen to make it to a ripe old age and you fall into the dirt of this earth, that Holy Spirit is going to continue on, isn't He? And we are just being picked up like a leaf in that wind, and we're going for a ride. Mm -hmm. And the ride is good. But we don't know where we're going because the Spirit of God doesn't tell us the full details of the future of our lives, does He? Mm -hmm. He walks us by step by step. And sometimes all we can hear is just a little wind. And it's something like this. of the wind that we hear that calls us to action as Christians and we jump in because we're spirit now we are spiritual people we are spiritual beings yes I'm trapped in this 
this stuff. But this stuff isn't what defines me. It's just flesh and bone. It ain't the prettiest flesh and bone. It ain't the healthiest flesh and bone. It ain't the tallest. It ain't the shortest. It ain't the fattest. It ain't the skinniest. All it is is a vehicle for my spirit. And my spirit, it comes and goes as God directs. I have no more control over my spirit coming or going than I have over the wind. When God says, my spirit is time to come home, can I stop it? When God says, my spirit is time to, to, to be empowered, can I stop it? Oh, I can try, and I'll be miserable. But if God so wills it, it will happen. So he, Jesus is revealing a whole lot to this guy. We read in 9 and 10... Judy, you, you left off in 8. Yeah. 9 and 10. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? And Jesus answered and said to him, Are you a teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Hmm. Hmm. Here we have an old man been serving God his whole life. And he don't know the basics of salvation. Do you know that we have a lot of people out in this world that think they are serving God, but they don't know the basics of salvation? Do you know that? They, we got people out here that can quote this from front to back and know more scripture than anybody. And you know what? They are void of the knowledge of what it takes to make it to heaven. They think because they did a little prayer at five years old and that they, they got a head full of knowledge of what this word says that they are going to make it to heaven. But I'm here to tell you that Jesus said, basically, if you don't have a relationship with me, if you don't know me, you're not going to make it. Let's read on. Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and we testify what we have seen and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven but he who came down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man who is in heaven. Who is in, who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but, through the, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe in him is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world. The men love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, and his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. I turn back just a little bit. Those of you have to turn over the page. There was a reference to a serpent in Moses. You read that, right? Mm -hmm. Does anybody know what that's about? Mm -hmm. Some do. Anybody else know what that's about? Well, let me bring you up to speed. The, the, the children of Israel, when they were in the wilderness, started grumbling and complaining that God's not taking care of them. They, they didn't like the food. And their, their grumbling was a sin. They had grumbled so thoroughly that it, God looked it upon it as sin. And so what did he do? He sent vipers, snakes, 
into their camp. And just a multitude of these, these children of Israel died because of these snakes. Well, then they come to Moses and they cry out to Moses and say, Forgive us for our grumbling and free us from these snakes. So God told him to do what? Make a snake. Make a, an image of this viper, which is rare for our God that he should do anything like that. But he said, make an image of that viper and hold it up. And all that are bitten that see it will live. And those that are bitten and don't see it will die. So, by looking to what God made, they live. Jesus is saying, I'm not the viper, but I'm the one that God sent for them to look upon. If they'll look upon me, they will be saved even though they've been bitten by sin. He's like, all I want them to do is come and look upon me and know that I am the one sent from God. I am their deliverance. You know, the medical field still uses that as a symbol of healing. Sure does. A snake. Oh, and if you back. wondered where that came from, that's where it comes from. The image that Moses carved, it was for their healing after being bit by the vipers. But there is a group of preachers in this world that don't know Jesus. They know how to preach. They know how to teach. But they don't have a relationship. And so they can't teach you to have a relationship if they don't have a relationship. And let me tell you, it's not about whether you're sinning. It's not about whether you're holy. It's about the relationship with God because your, your own idea of holiness is so righteous rags. Filthy. It's what God calls them, filthy rags compared to his righteousness. You may think you're holy and all that in a bag of chips, name brand. But when God looks at your life, if he don't see the blood of Jesus applied to your heart, he sees filthiness. And I'm telling you right now, there is nothing that can save you but a relationship with Jesus. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For he sent his son not into the world to condemn the world, but through him that they might be saved. I'm sure you have friends that think they're Christians. Everybody got friends that think they're Christians? Do you know friends that think they're Christians when you discern that they're not? They have no relationship, they have history. You know what? I'm Cherokee, German, and a little bit of some other stuff. I can go around calling me, me my, myself a, a Cherokee German, or a German Cherokee. Whatever sounds phonetically better. But I'm no more a Cherokee than I am an Alaskan. Look at me. Do I look Cherokee? No. And if I go down to the Cherokee Reservation, do you think there are big, big differences between the way they look and the way I look? How about the way they talk and the way I talk? How about what they believe in and what I believe in? So I may call myself a Cherokee, and I may have the lineage to prove it. But saying you're something does not mean you are something. Just because you have history of being a child of God don't mean you're a child of God. Just because Grandma took you to Sunday school and you said a prayer when you were four years old and accepted Jesus in your heart, but then you never returned to that relationship, that relationship was but for a moment. You better get right with God because you may not make it. Some people don't like what I'm telling them. Some Ooh. people don't believe what I'm telling them. But I'm telling you that if you don't have a relationship with God that is alive, then it's dead. 
and a dead relationship with Christ may not get you through the gate. So I guess I wrap this up in, in saying that do we want to be like Nicodemus? Do we want to slide in through the side door, come to Jesus in the night? Or do we want to go boldly to the throne, knowing who we are in him, knowing what he can do for us and have a relationship with him? You know what? I love Jesus. Yeah, right. Um, you know, Nicodemus knew. He knew what the Bible says. He knew what the Old Testament scriptures said. But he didn't understand the difference between being just born of naturally. Like Jesus was saying it's not enough to be a Jew. It's not enough to be born into a Christian family. There's a spiritual element that involves the Holy Spirit that you're not understanding, Nicodemus. And I think a lot of people who have been in church a long time or you know, went to church as a little kid, they're told, you know, they're told John 3.16. They've said the words. But no one's ever explained to them the difference between it's not enough to just be born into a Christian family or to be in church. There is a spiritual element that has to become real and alive in you for you to really be born again. So my question, Pastor, is how do we explain that to a person who's not sure am I really saved or did I just go through the motions? How do I know? What's the evidence that I really got born again of the Spirit? What is the evidence? How do well, I know? How do you know? Well, first of all... In, in common English, not Bible. You, your life will be renewed. You will feel different. You will feel a desire to please God. You will feel a desire to seek Him out in both prayer... And you will feel desire to worship him. You will feel desire to read his word. And if you have no desire to read his word, you have no desire to pray, if you have no desire to please him, then I'm, I'm telling you that what you, you think you experienced didn't get it done. Because when we accept Christ, he becomes the Lord of our life. And we don't change right away into this Super holy being. How many super holy right now? Yeah. It's been a process of him molding us and shaping us. I can tell you now that the person that I am is much better than the person that I used to be. And that's not me. That's God moving through me and in me. So, if your life hasn't changed, if you've not experienced a uh, a transformation in your mind where you're no longer thinking about what you want but you also encompass thinking about what God wants for you and if you're thinking about eternal things instead of temporal things you might have had a relationship and an encounter with God but if you are if you're still selfish and you're still all about me and it, it's it's you're not thinking about what God wants for you and not thinking about how your decisions affect what God wants for your life then you're probably not in the right relationship with him. And if you're not in a right relationship with him, one, you're not a, you were never saved, or two, you were saved, but you never really built that relationship to the point where you're trusting in him and you're leaning on him as your Lord. So, and I know from several scriptures in the Bible, some people don't believe this, that if you're found to be lukewarm, Revelation says you'll be vomited out of his mouth. It also says that if he's going to say to several that said they did things for him, depart from me, I don't know you. And that word know is that intimacy of relationship. In other words, he didn't have a relationship with you. And a relationship isn't one-sided, it's two ways. You can talk to God and you're blue in the face, but if you don't ever listen to what he's trying to tell you, if you don't ever seek his counsel and his word, in prayer, in meditation, if you don't ever try to just listen for what God is giving you for as far as direction for your life, then your one-sided relationship may not be what it really is. It may just be some fathom of your mind that thinks that you're serving something, but you're not. Because a relationship is a two-way road. So what do I do then if I think, you know, I don't think I was really saved? 
you get on your face and you cry out to God to be the Lord of your life, to, re to reveal himself to you, and to repent of the sin in your life. A lot of times it's just a matter of we've got junk in our life and we refuse to get rid of it. But then we want to we want to be a Christian. But we won't, we have our pet sins and we're not getting rid of them. We're, for God or nobody, I'm going to hang on to this. And we can't do that because God says that we're either going to make him the Lord of our lives because we can't serve two masters. We're either going to serve God or we're going to re rebel against what God wants for us and, and, and in doing so it makes you an enemy of God. 